Hey, Wilshire, this is Rob. Thanks so much for tuning in. I'm excited to unpack God's Word with you today. Before we begin, I want you to know as your pastor, I continue to pray for you. I'm praying that God's peace, His provision, His comfort uh, would cover you in a special way during this season. I I know our world has, it seems like, has changed overnight. And many of our jobs, the economy, our families, everything has been impacted. May you know that God is with you. He has not forgotten you, will not forsake you during this season. If you're new to our community, I'm one of the pastors here, and we have been doing these short little devotionals looking and going through the book of John. John was an eyewitness of Jesus's life. And so we're hearing what he taught, and we're, we're getting to explore Jesus in incredible ways. So I invite you, we're going to go to John chapter 4. I invite you, you can follow along or open up your Bible. We also, week by week, are studying these. So I want to invite you to our 1030 services that we gather online each and every Sunday here on YouTube. So please share, share it with a friend. We would love to see you as we gather, we worship, and we sing together. Let's read John chapter 4. As we're going there, we've been doing a a SOAP method. It's an acronym for Scripture, which is God's Word, observation, seeing what it says, application, how does it apply to our lives, how can the Holy Spirit work in our lives, and then prayer, crying out to the God of the universe. So I invite you to read along with me. John chapter 4, verse 43. Now this is after the interaction between Jesus and the woman in the well. After the two days, he left for Galilee. Now, Jesus himself had pointed out that a prophet has no honor in his own country. When he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. They had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, for they also had been there. Once more, he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. Now, and there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. Unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. The royal official said, Sir, come down before my child dies. Go, Jesus replied, your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. While he was still on the way, the servants met him with the news that his boy was living. When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, Yesterday, at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. Then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. So he and his whole household believed. This was the second sign Jesus performed after coming from Judea to Galilee. This is God's word. Now let's look at just a a few key things. As Jesus is entering into the region of Galilee, we find that Jesus was from southern Galilee in Nazareth. And so that's why John notes that Jesus said a prophet has no honor in his own country. So what we come to find is that Jesus didn't grow up in a family with noble birth. They weren't highly religious. They didn't have all of the religious accolades. And we we see that in Matthew's gospel, they complain as Jesus is making bold claims. They say, who is this man? He's just simply the son of a carpenter. In the beginning of John's gospel, there's a man that says, Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? Jesus comes into a simple family, showing, demonstrating to us that his ways are not our ways. The ways we esteem certain positions in society, Jesus comes to transform the whole kingdom, to transform the whole world and turn it upside down. And so as we go on, we note this, that the whole story about uh, this interaction with the royal official It's a story of compassion because you have Jesus who meets the father's needs. The son, the father's crying out for his son who's dying. In this day and age, 
the, the sons, they had a great importance. They carried the family's name, especially if it was the firstborn, the family name, uh, the property, the estate, and they were responsible for taking care of the whole family. Jesus, well aware of this, understands what the royal official is going through. And so Jesus draws near to him, and, and as the man cries out, Jesus replies, he says, go, your son will live. Jesus meets our most basic needs, and he even heals this son so this son will now live. God has compassion on you and me. I think now more than ever, we need to cry out like the royal official, crying out for healing for the land, healing in our own families, in our community. And so this is what the man did. Another key observation here is this, that it says a certain royal official... Now, John's gospel has been introducing all sorts of different characters to us. In John chapter 2, we saw that Jesus was with the common people at a wedding in Cana. And so even when Jesus performs a miracle, he does it through the servants. He uses the servants to turn the water into wine. And then later on, we see that Jesus has an interaction with Nicodemus, who Nicodemus is very high in society. He's Ivy League quality, if you will. And so Jesus interacts with him. And then we see that Jesus has this conversation with a woman at the well. She's an outcast in society, pushed off to the side, marginalized. Uh, so much shame in, is given to her in society. And now Jesus is having an interaction with a royal official. You see, the gospel, the good news, Jesus came for the whole world. For God so loved the world. That's what we find out. That this gospel, this good news that John is writing about is for everybody. For those that have high socioeconomic status, for those who have low, those who are privileged, those who are not. It's for everybody. So wherever you find yourself, may you know that the God of the universe has come for you. Maybe you've thought before, Oh, the, the, this gospel, Jesus is only, he only came to take advantage of the poor. That's simply not true. Jesus had uh, great interactions and great conversations with people that were highly esteemed in society, brilliant minds. And in fact, this royal official, at the end, he believes and his whole household believes. It's incredible. So we see continuing on here, uh, a few notes uh, to take are this. In verse 48, Jesus says, Unless you people see the signs and wonders, you will never believe. Now, at the end of John's gospel, he has, Jesus has this interaction with another character, Thomas, one of the disciples. And Thomas says, I will not believe that Jesus rose again from the grave unless I see it. Jesus comes to him. Jesus also has compassion on him and shows him his hands where the nails were driven through. And Thomas then believes. So Jesus meets Thomas in his doubts. Even though he says these people will never believe without the signs, he still, Jesus in this case, performs the signs. Jesus says at the end of John's gospel, it is better for those, blessed are those who do not see and still believe. And yet he still has compassion on those that are looking and wanting and needing something a little more. As we continue on in the story of compassion, we see that Jesus meets the man, verse 52, and as he sends him out and he's going back, when the man comes back, it says, when he inquired as the time his son got better, they said to him, yesterday at one in the afternoon, that's when the fever left him. The man realizes this was the exact time Jesus said, go, your son will live. We need to understand that God works in mighty ways. And that Jesus, who was physically present, God in the flesh, walked among us, and yet he was able to heal the son when he was not physically present with him. We need to trust in this time, and cry out to God, and trust that he can heal, although Jesus is not physically present with us. God is powerful. He is mighty, and he works in ways that we will never fully understand. But what I think we can take from this, like the royal official, 
who kindly and respectfully cried, Sir. He cried out for his on behalf of his son. As followers of Jesus, we not only cry out for our own family, we cry out for God's family, and we cry out for the world. We cry out for those who don't know Jesus. Because Jesus performed this sign, and the whole family ended up believing. Their lives were transformed. It's incredible how he works, and he can work even through you here today. I want to leave you with this one last final thought, and it's here in verse 50. Right after Jesus says, go, your son will live. The next line, this is the key. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. Where do you in your life need to take Jesus at his word? The promises that he's given us. The promise that he will never leave us or forsake us. He never promised that everything will go smoothly in this world. But he promised to always be there. God promises he calls us to cast our anxiety on him because he cares for us. Would you trust in this time, although it is so difficult and it is hard, trust me, I know. But would you cast your cares your anxiety on him because he cares for you? Would you trust that God cares for you? That God is present even through such difficult times? In a moment, I'm going to invite you to pray with me. And we're going to pray for, I want to pray for you. I want to pray for our nation. I want to pray for our community. Just like the royal official, would we go to Jesus right now and ask for healing? Ask for more people to come to know him and experience life and living water. So would you pray with me now? Heavenly Father, you are a good God. You are a God that speaks. You say, go, and upon your words comes life, everlasting life. So Father, may you bring healing right now to our own hearts. Uh, May you also bring healing as the royal official. He cried out for his son. May we cry out for our community, for our nation, for our world. Uh, For those impacted by the virus, Lord, would you heal them? Would you protect people? Uh, As in the news, we've got news of uh, more deaths that are projected. Father, we ask that you would reverse this trend and that there would not be as many deaths that are projected, that you would protect your people. Uh, Father, would you work through scientists? Uh, We thank you also for first responders and doctors and nurses that are sacrificing uh, their health so others might live and get well. God, we ask for healing. We ask for healing over the land, healing over hearts. Would you work in our lives powerfully? Father, we trust you. We, We put our lives into your hands. And the God of comfort, we love you. We praise you, and we ask you to work powerfully in this time. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hey, thanks so much for joining us. It's been good to get in God's word together. May you know that God loves you. May his peace that transcends all understanding may guard your heart and minds in Christ Jesus. We hope to see you this Sunday as we gather at 1030. Jesus has this interaction with this person that's in isolation, that is alone, and that is suffering. And so may you come to hear uh, the words of life that Jesus has to give uh, as we look at his word in, in John in the next chapter. So can't wait to see you on Sundays. We gather at 1030. God bless you and keep you. We'll see you soon.